Good evening. This is Kelly Wright. Thanks for joining us as we spend the next hour together. You are looking at protesters on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky. They are outraged. They are angry. They are disappointed. They are sad, heartbroken, and demanding justice in the wake of findings from a grand jury on three police officers involved in the shooting death of 26-year-old EMT worker Brianna Taylor. You'll recall that she was killed in her own apartment last March 13th. And now, six months later, the grand jury finds that Brett Hankinson, one of the three police officers involved in that shooting of Brianna Taylor, has been charged with a lesser charge of wanton disregard. Many were expecting much more. Many are demanding justice for Breonna Taylor and her family. The Attorney General of Kentucky, Daniel Cameron, talked to the public about the Breonna Taylor case and the grand jury. I know that many in Louisville and across the Commonwealth and country have been anxiously awaiting the completion of our investigation into the death of Ms. Brianna Taylor. Prior to this announcement, I spoke with Ms. Palmer, Brianna Taylor's mother, uh, to share with her the results from the grand jury. Many of you in this room know that I had the opportunity last month to meet in person with her and other members of Ms. Taylor's family, including Ms. Bianca Austin and Ms. Janiya Palmer. I want to once again publicly express my condolences. Every day, this family wakes up to the realization that someone they loved is no longer with them. There's nothing I can offer today to wake, take away the grief and heartache this family is experiencing as a result of losing a child, a niece, a sister, and a friend. What I can provide today are the facts, which my office has worked long and hard to uncover, analyze, and scrutinize since accepting this case in mid-May. I urge everyone listening today to not lose sight of the fact that a life has been lost, a tragedy under any circumstances. And so there you have it, the statement from Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron uh, in commenting on the case involving Breonna Taylor. Uh, joining me now to weigh in on it uh, from a legal perspective to break this all down, uh, civil rights attorney Mark Harris. He's a partner with the Ben Crump Law Firm. I should point out that Ben Crump is representing the family of Breonna Taylor in this case. And then we also are joined by Timothy Allen Simon, an attorney as well, owner of TAS Strategies. Uh, gentlemen, how do you see this case? Uh, three officers, one of them charged with wanton disregard. Let's begin with that from the grand jury, handing down an indictment of wanton disregard. Legally, what does that mean and how does it impact uh, Brett Hankinson, who's been charged with that? It, it, it basically is a negligent homicide. It's a finding and a determination on the part of the grand jury led by the special prosecutor in this case, the attorney general of the state of Kentucky, Daniel Cameron, to a conclusion that only one of the three officers, as you mentioned, has any kind of culpability. And the culpability that former officer Brett Hankinson has is, if you will, glorified negligence. It does not rise to the level of manslaughter. It clearly doesn't rise to the level of murder. And what's the most atrocious about this whole process is it's not even attached to the behavior of the officer, the former officer, relative to the death of Breonna Taylor. It, it, it ties itself to the behavior of the officers on the scene relative to Breonna Taylor's neighbors, the neighboring apartments. What the result, the sum total of this whole process seems to be that Breonna Taylor's worth is worth nothing. Not only do black lives not matter in Kentucky, clearly Breonna Taylor's life didn't matter. Timothy. Well, uh, Attorney Harris is correct. Uh, typically, when you're talking about wanton disregard, it's a, it's a level of negligence that's above recklessness or gross negligence. 
it generally is, doesn't come into the criminal framework, every though, even though every state has different you know, criminal and civil laws in this regard. Uh, I think the, the tragic uh, matter here, and this happens often with grand juries, one, it was not an independent prosecutor, it was the attorney general. There should have been an independent special counsel. The relationship between the attorney generals, the district attorneys, and the law enforcement officers, they all come out of the same nest, basically. And my experience has been it's rare that you find true independence. There have been occasions, but it's rare you find true independence. I think the other thing that's important for the public to understand is that the question become was, should they stand trial? Should they simply stand trial? And when decisions are made by grand juries or police chiefs that individuals should not, that there was not sufficient probable cause for these three officers, well, two, the two additional officers, but to stand trial is, in my opinion, not well thought out. And I, and I think I brought this up in our last discussion that what happened, and I want to respect the family and their privacy, but the circumstances surrounding Breonna Taylor after she was shot, that in of itself to me was a, was a disregard for life. The only charges that were brought were the charges because bullets went into the neighbor's premises. So in summation, Breonna Taylor, and, and Kenneth Walker, is that, is that gentleman's name? Yeah, Kenneth yeah, Walker. Kenneth Walker. Uh, their lives didn't matter. Their lives did not matter in this case. It was purely based upon the fact that, a bu that bullets went into the, neighboring, uh, uh, into the neighbor's home, which was tragic in and of itself. There was no reason for that to be a violent entry into the apartment of Kenneth Walker and Breonna Taylor. Yeah, and, and Mark, we had heard before that uh, it was a no-knock warrant and, and yet uh, Daniel Cameron stated, according to his investigation, uh, his independent investigation, that uh, the officers, uh, particularly uh, uh, Sergeant Mattingly, did knock on the door uh, and that he was uh, apparently heard by one of the neighbors as identifying himself as a police officer when they didn't hear a response. And keep in mind, this was in the middle of the night when he didn't hear a response. That's when officers forced their way in. And in going in, he was basically met at the door. He could see uh, Kenneth Walker standing there with a weapon pointed towards the gun. And as Kenneth Walker went on to say that he did a uh, fire shot, that shot apparently hit uh, Mattingly in his thigh. And to Walker's point, he didn't know who was coming into the door. So now we have this case wherein Mattingly is not charged. Uh, Detective Cosgrove, who is with Manley, is not charged. Uh, Hankinson, who was firing indiscriminately from outside, is charged with wanton disregard. Where does this leave in, in solving the burning question about why is Brianna Taylor dead? And you have uh, the Attorney General Cameron blaming, or at least insinuating, uh, that the death is responsible because of Kenneth Walker opening fire on a police officer. Let me tell you, I think with all due respect to the Attorney General of the, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, in the words of James Brown, he's talking loud and saying nothing. I think the bottom line that all of us wanted was an answer to whether or not there would be some criminal culpability, criminal blameworthiness attached to the death of Breonna Taylor. And it seems as though the answer to that is no. Everything else is contrived as far as I'm concerned. To charge these officers and only one of the officers with indiscriminately firing in a, in a manner that brought about the, the harm, not to another person, but to the apartments of Breonna Taylor's neighbors, that's insulting. And it's why you're gonna see a reaction that I think is going to be just an, an over uh, the top upheaval of frustration and pain and anger. Uh, and in some ways, I think it's justified. I think as long as we continue to have the degradation of black lives, the absolute decriminalization of police conduct that's inappropriate, we're gonna wind up right back at the same place, unfortunately. This is why we find ourselves talking so uh, deeply about police reform and how police 
uh, and the black community should ex uh, find a way to better uh, exchange information with each other and deal with each other. This, this is a, a tragedy for everyone involved. Breonna Taylor's family can't get her back and the police in Louisville, Kentucky will have a, a, a Herculean task in winning the trust of that community. Well, that's, that's the truth about it, is that bad officers harm all, both law enforcement. And by the way, let us not forget, Breonna Taylor was a first responder. She was an EMT. She saved lives for a living. But what also bothers me about Eter Attorney General Cameron's very politicized remark, for him to make the reference that we do not make decisions by emotions. Mm -hmm. For those who know us who understand the dog whistle, and being a former Republican, I'm very familiar with the dog whistle. I could do a concerto of the dog whistle. Uh, we have been characterized as an emotional people, not utilizing reasoning and deductive reasoning in our conclusions that we've drawn. And to also reference mob violence, which has nothing to do with Breonna Taylor or Kenneth Walker. Mm -hmm. These are citizens protesting improper police conduct. So in my view, Attorney General Cameron is doubling down on the Republican message of law and order at a time when there should have been more attention on the loss of life and the need for justice and for the officers to face charges. If they beat the trial, so be it. Wrong, but still, at least we know that justice was properly served. But for two of those officers who entered that apartment under those circumstances to walk, basically says that it's free game, it's hunting season on African Americans in Louisville, Kentucky, in their homes. I don't think that's the way that city wants to be, the good citizens of Louisville, the home of Muhammad Ali. I don't think that's the way those citizens want to be characterized in terms of their city. Uh, what does this say to Black America about the fact that Breonna Taylor, a first responder, as you pointed out, Timothy, an EMT who was working on the front lines of COVID cases, is shot dead in her home by people that she worked with periodically by being out there on the front lines as a first responder. And, and yet, you know, one has to wonder now, the, 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 district, the, uh, the mayor has apologized to the family after the $12 million settlement. Uh, and the attorney general, Daniel Cameron, has apologized to the family. But how do you bring peace to a community that is so saddened by this and angered by the lack of punishment or what they consider uh, justice. Well, we've things. seen peace in the past that's been brought about by way of having the proper leadership in place. While the mayor's statements during uh, the settlement should be applauded, as I understand, it took an extended period of time for him to even reach out to the family. And the fact is, is that Mr. Walker and Ms. Taylor, God rest her soul and my prayers go to the family. They were criminalized and this happens every day. And until we begin to really roll back bias in policing, uh, we're gonna continue to see these types of incidents, number one, and then number two, unless we have reform and how these matters are prosecuted, we'll continue to see these types of verdicts or grand, or grand jury uh, 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 conclusions. And uh, that's why we need to be conscious of who is elected attorney general, who is elected district attorney, who is appointed as police chief. What is the training that police receive? Again, I fail to understand why they had to enter that apartment guns bla blazing. There's been given no reasonable uh, validation to me as to why that incident took place in the first place. And now to have a loss of life and another young man injured for reasons that still cannot be uh, uh, validated is tragic, and this is why we need to get out and vote. You know, I vote for dog catcher. You got to vote for every level of government to ensure that you have the people that are fit for the position and understand its implications. Mark, your, your partner, um, Ben Crump, what is he saying about this, and what is the family saying about this? Obviously, uh, the family is disappointed with um, this particular grand jury uh, conclusion. I think you got it right. We're, everyone's disappointed. You know, we're weary. I hit you earlier and told you I'm very weary to use the term that the old folks used to use. 
The thing, one of the things that bothers me the most, in fact, there are two items, there are two aspects of this that bother me the most, Kelly. One, we've already talked about, that at, at bottom, none of the conduct that directly impacted Breonna Taylor has been criminalized at all. Not one element of that uh, will anybody face any criminal charges for. The city seems to be taking the position endorsed by the attorney general of the state that basically the family got paid $12 million. Now you folks go away. That, that bothers me. The second thing though, is what came out of the words out of the mouth of attorney general Cameron earlier, where he said, Ms. Taylor was shot six times, but only one of the bullets was fatal. What? How could you, how could you diminish the fact that this person who did nothing wrong, but be in her bed, in her apartment, as, as has been pointed out after serving a shift, serving the people, was shot six times, but hey, only one of them was fatal. So what's, what are folks complaining about is the inference. That, that's, I, I don't have the words to describe how frustrated that makes me. And you know, with our conservative courts now, it's gonna take considerable lawyering by people like Attorney Crump and, and, and Attorney Harris to craft these briefs and to bring these matters to light in a way that draws the votes, that changes these police procedures. And then from a local level, young people, you have to fight for, all of us actually, citizen oversight of police forces. We are so close. Where are you, my conservatives? We are so close to a police state in what we're observing right now. And everyone, white, yellow, black, green, should be concerned about that fine line between criminal, what we call criminal justice and a police state. And what we witnessed in that Breonna Taylor apartment invasion was more police state than it was criminal justice. Gentlemen, I wanna thank you. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, what's going on uh, with, with all sorts of things that, are, that have been happening, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, reaching to more than 200,000 deaths. We'll also focus on uh, what will likely take place this Saturday when the President of the United States makes his pick to replace Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And of course, we'll focus on the legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who lies in state now on the steps of the Supreme Court. Talking to attorneys Mark Harris and Timothy Allen Simon, we'll be back with more after this. hundred thousand Americans dead because of COVID-19. I'm here at the Washington Monument that you can see over my shoulder and the flags surrounding the Washington Monument are at half staffed in remembrance of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg who died last Friday. But also here are 20,000 miniature U.S. flags. They were placed here by the COVID-19 Memorial Project each of them representing the 200,000 people who have died. 20,000 flags placed here in honor and tribute to those who have lost their lives. The COVID-19 Memorial Project states that these 200,000 people died needlessly. Echoing the sentiments of so many Americans who state that we could have saved more lives had we developed a plan to really go after this pandemic with all the vigor and strength and intelligence and science of our federal government. I mean, frontline workers have lost their lives, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, grandparents, cousins, people that we hold dear. Some people have come here to reflect upon this and others have come here just to pray. But the point is, 200,000 lives have been lost and it's growing. And we as Americans must stand together and come together to not only flatten the curve, but end the pain and the heartbreak that has hurt us because of COVID-19. 
So joining me now as we talk about the 200,000 COVID deaths and more are my good friends from the West Coast, my West Coast connection in the house, attorneys, Mark Harris and Timothy Allen Simon. And I should point out that Mark Harris is the partner to the Ben Crump Law Firm and Timothy Allen Simon owns TAS Strategies. He also serves as chairman of the board of directors for the California Black Chamber of Commerce, attorneys at Owl, and very astute political strategists. Gentlemen, thank you for being on today. Thank you for having us. Thank we've got you. a lot to talk about. The, the sad reality is that we've got to talk about these 200,000 deaths and it's climbing. Uh, and, and this was predicted uh, back in March. If we didn't get uh, to a point of flattening this curve on the coronavirus, we would see 200,000 cases. And there are some predictions that we could see that escalate to more than 400,000 cases. This boils down to what kind of leadership we've had on this. I want to ask you both, uh, has the federal government put out the right plan to stop coronavirus in its tracks so that we might save lives and not see 200,000 deaths? Mark, I'll begin with you. Thank you, Kelly. Again, thank you for having me on your show. There's a, there's a dual uh, issue here as far as I'm concerned. Number one, the government and the role of the government in being leader in chief of setting the right tone, of setting the right example, uh, presidents and others in government. I, as a former uh, administration official with uh, uh, the Honorable William Jefferson Clinton, uh, we had a responsibility. We took an oath, a sacred oath to uh, basically do what was in the best interest of the American people. I don't believe that's what's happening with this administration. Uh, one example, what we saw from the Center for Disease Control, which is supposed to be the impartial objective um, determiner of our behavior relative to identifying and containing disease spread, had on its website, of course, the information about the aerosol transmission of COVID, and then it was taken off. I mean, it either is or it isn't. And it's very difficult for us, just regular folks, to understand which way is up from this administration relative to its message. So I don't put all 200,000 deaths on the president or on this administration, but I think a large number of those deaths can directly be left at the White House door at 1600 Pennsylvania relative to how this administration has behaved. Uh, where do we go from here then in terms of dealing with this? I've spoken with uh, uh, quite a few people on this program this past week dealing with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. One is talking about we've got to increase the testing in particular in the black community, mm -hmm. which of course is disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Others have, have stated that we've got to stop politicizing wearing masks and start wearing them and follow good safe social distancing. And uh, one doctor on this program has stated that it is aerosolized. And because mm -hmm. of that, we should be careful uh, to wear masks because of the fact that it's aerosol. We know that the president of the United States told investigative journalist Bob Woodward uh, in the book Rage on tape stating, well, Bob, it's aeros aerosolized. It's aerosol. It can hit anywhere. So where do we go from here? and taking care of ourselves as Americans. For us, by us. Uh, back in the day, of course, there was a, an African-American owned clothing manufacturer that went by the acronym FUBU, F-U-B-U, for us, by us. We have to take care of ourselves. That's what I meant by dual tracks. The government is one side of that. And then our own common sense is the other side, our own compassion for one another. I tell people, Kelly, I wear a mask not to protect me, but to protect you. And everyone should feel the same way. There should be a mandatory mask requirement throughout the country. I think that's at minimum. The one thing the CDC director said that I agree with, the mask will be more effective at preventing coronavirus spread than any shot. I completely agree with that. So that's one thing we can all do. And each one of us has a responsibility to do. Kevin, before we take a break, what say you? Well, the, the virus has not gone away. It's still here. And we have to have our human behavior under that assumption, and particularly African Americans, not only because of our high degree of uh, preconditions that exist in our community, but actually the lack of health care as well. So I think it's every, very important for every American, and particularly African American, to take all imaginable precautions. And I know we have essential workers who are on the front lines. They don't have the convenience like we have 
of working from our homes. Uh, but we just have to be vigilant in this. And, I, and unfortunately, you cannot rely upon government guidance any longer. You have to take it into your own hands. You have to own the responsibility. Absolutely. We're coming back with more of uh, Timothy Allen Simon and Mark Harris. Back with more of this. One of the things that stands out to me about Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her latter years, she was uh, reflecting on her work and civil rights. And she went on to state, you know, there must come a time that uh, they take their feet off our necks. Mm. I thought that was very, a a very powerful, uh, you know, she she was small in stature, small in size, I should say, but uh, powerful in the things that she would say and the passion that she had, not only for the law, but also for moving America towards a more perfect union. Uh, given that, who can replace her? And is it time to replace her? The, the, it looks like it's all done, that uh, the president will be able to make his choice known on Saturday, as he has stated, uh, following the, uh, the fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be lying in state, the first woman to do that. And, and before I go to what President Trump is, is about to do, uh, let's let's talk about that. She is the first woman to lie in state uh, at the Capitol uh, coming up this uh, this Friday, this Thursday and Friday. It's an honor well deserved. Uh, it's an honor that, quite honestly, uh, we shouldn't take for granted. Now, remember, in this country, women have only had the right to vote for a hundred years. Uh, we think sometimes that all of the rights that we now take for granted. Uh, were shared with everyone equally from the 1700s post-American Revolution. Of course, the Constitution ratified in in the 1780s, the Supreme Court coming into existence in the 1800s, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, with the famous line from Marbury versus Madison about the court being the one who will be the final determiner. We take for granted that these rights have been around for a long time. They haven't. The fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is only the second woman to have served on the United States Supreme Court behind the late Sandra Day O'Connor. The fact that both of them were superstars in their respective law schools, Stanford and Columbia respectively. And the fact that they couldn't get jobs even as legal secretaries when they came into the profession. We have not moved as far as we should, even though we've been at this for quite a long time. Uh, I think it's a great honor to have Justice uh, Ginsburg to lie in state, but it's also somewhat of a disgrace that it took this long for this nation to recognize the important impact that women um, have in our lives, in our country, and particularly in the policy space. So it's it's an important step, but it also makes it realize that the history of this nation is just uh, ripe with discrimination and denial of people because of their gender or race. But be that as it may, I think, Ruth Bader Ginsburg stands as a symbol of freedom to all who seek justice in society, regardless of their gender. I think it's important that we as men make certain that we are doing everything we can to make our daughters, uh, you know, have the opportunities that, you know, we should have. And in many cases, we don't. We're moving towards a perfect union. So I think she stands supreme in that position. Well said, gentlemen. We're going to take a break. And as we do take a break, we show video now of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lying in state on the steps of the Supreme Court. When we return, we'll talk about President Trump and what his choices uh, may be. He says he's going to pick a woman. We'll talk about that next. Welcome back now to the program, and we're talking to Timothy Allen Simon and Mark uh, Harris. Uh, The West Coast Connection is in the house to weigh in on politics, all things political coming out of Washington and uh, how it impacts our lives. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we've talked about her in the previous segment, giving her the accolades and the tribute she deserves and the honors and the legacy that she continues to have and the impact she has on America. 
But as you know, the Republicans could not wait to get this opportunity to go ahead and make a nomination, to make a pick. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says, whoever the president uh, chooses, they will push it through in record time, uh, under 40 days between now and the election to make sure that the president uh, makes his choice known and that choice uh, make it to the Supreme Court uh, to replace the vacancy left by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Is this the right, right approach? I mean, they're in power. They have the power to do it. They have the right. The question is whether they should exercise it. Our conversation, of course, before the show, Commissioner Simon used a term that I think is very appropriate here. This president behaves as a monarch. He, he, but he behaves as, he, as though he has unilateral authority in every way imaginable. Unfortunately, in this space, the appointment of the United States Supreme Court Justice, he does have unilateral authority. He's got the advice and consent of the Senate relative to whomever he picks, but he has constitutionally the unilateral authority to make whatever appointment he believes is fair and credible at any time during his presidency. One thing that President Trump said that's disturbing but true is the people's choice is represented by my election. <laughs> we have a representative government. I am the one who's representing the people on this, therefore my selection, it's a tough thing for Democrats and progressives to swallow, but it is in fact the law, constitutionally prescribed. And so as disturbing as it is, the only thing that we can do to change it would be to change the constitution or to have the Congress, which has authority over the Supreme Court to make some changes. And we can talk about that a little bit later. So, Timothy, who are the choices for the president? Uh, he is uh, he can he can actually pick two women uh, that he's looking at quite closely, uh, one from Florida and one from uh, who uh, at Notre Dame. I think, uh, you know, I have not really researched the background of what they are claiming is the short list. The president still has that decision to make. Both seem competent, in my opinion. Uh, uh, Justice Leoga has had a short period of time on the circuit court, but uh, it's not really a question of competency. It's a question, in my view, of the actions of the Senate and their recent history. You cannot discuss this appointment or the Gorsuch appointment without discussing Merrick Garland. And it's just ironic listening to uh, Senator and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, former presidential candidate Mitt Romney, claim that this is the correct action to take. Uh, and if we go back to Merrick Garland, where, where, where the Republicans are playing wordsmithing games, the demand from President Obama and most of the public was to bring him to a floor vote. It was not to appoint him. It was for the Senate to do their job to exercise the advice and consent of the president's appointee. That was denied by one man, Mitch McConnell. And so what we're coming back to here is that, you know, the founders, yes, they owned our ancestors. I have viewed the Constitution as a living and breathing document. I am not a strict constructionist. I am not an originalist because I recognize that this was a country marred in many ways by slavery and genocide and denial of women's rights at the time of that Constitution's founding. But I do believe it provides a vision for justice. So for those to claim that they're sticking to what the founders intended by way of this process of appointment, I just find a, a, a very shallow and weak argument, quite frankly. Timothy Allen Simon, Mark Harris, attorneys at law. I appreciate you both. God bless you. Thank, you, you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Bless you, Kelly. Thank you. We're coming back with more after this. Welcome back to the program. I'm delighted to have George and Tondra Gregory back on with us today to talk about uh, strengthening the family. It's such an important uh, task for each and every one of us to do in this, these troubling times in which we find ourselves living in. Uh, George and Tondra have been talking to us about having tough conversations. And tonight, uh, they are going to talk about having tough conversations with our children on the subject of race. This is a really big one because this is really going on in America right now. How do we do it? 
Yeah. Yes, Kelly, even, you know, I know it's, it's sometimes we want to protect our children, you know, me included, you want to protect our kids from, uh, you know, protect their innocence from having to deal with mm -hmm. the challenges of our society at large. And race is one of those um, taboo subjects that you try to steer away from and not want to talk to your kids about it. However, it is very important that we are the ones that shape our children's beliefs and understandings about race in the home and not let the world teach them about race. And by the, t by the time they're 12, pretty mm -hmm. much, you know, kids are typically developmentally kind of set in their ways and in their beliefs are kind of already set. So the earlier you can begin to deal with and tackle these tough conversations with your kids, the better. And what happens when our kids encounter tough situations uh, revolving around race, uh, you know, like on college campuses, for example, where some kids have been very cruel and, and sending a racial uh, tinge or racially charged, uh, uh, what they th consider humorous to, to black uh, students. And there's nothing humorous about it. It's, it's downright hurtful. Uh, and what do we do about it from a college level and even uh, a kindergarten level wherein race is entering into the picture and our kids are bringing you home saying, mom, dad, uh, am I this way? Am, am, I, am I not beautiful? Am I not accepted? Yeah, I'd like to think that there's, a, there's that kid song that we sing uh, as, as kids growing up in church, right? Red and yellow, black and white. We're all precious in his sight. Uh, God loves all the little children of the world. And so uh, as, as Christian parents, I think we have to set the stage mm -hmm. at talking about the diversity, mm -hmm. talking about uh, even with couples, we, we sometimes talk about that differences can pull you apart, but yet uh, our differences are really supposed to bridge us together yeah. because who wants a society where we all look the same? And so on a college campus, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of influential things that happen, right? And that we don't have control over. That's why it has to start at a very young age at arming our kids with what they need so that when they're, uh, faced with these challenges that they'll be able to think for themselves, Kelly. Yeah, let, let's take a break. When we come back from the break, we'll continue on with this very important conversation about how do we talk to our sons and daughters about dealing with issues of race, which they are coming up against uh, fast, quick, and in a hurry, maybe quicker than what we want. Uh, we're talking to George and Tonda Gregory after the break. Welcome back to the program. I'm talking to George and Tondra Gregory uh, for this segment of Strengthening the Family. And George and Tondra, I should point out, uh, have a program called Journey for Life. They are relationship and marriage uh, uh, coaches, some of the best in the business uh, and, and ministry for that matter. And they're also chaplains in the NFL for the NFL Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, we're talking about a very important topic, and that's talking to our children about race. It's a tough conversation. And some parents have expressed, Black parents have stated that, gee, I never thought I had to talk to my child this early about race. I, I'm recalling, for example, Bishop T.D. Jakes talking about when he was talking to one of his sons who had just turned six and a racial problem had come up in the school. And Jakes is thinking in his own mind, my God, you mean I have to have this conversation with you now? Mm. And do you as parents, have you gone through that? I know I've gone through that when dealing with my own children, but uh, it, it's, it's tough to have those conversations and you want your child to understand there's nothing different about them. There's something quite beautiful about them and about their color. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, we celebrate diversity in, in our home. Right. And, and what we realize is that I don't think this is a new problem. I think it's been here, but we just haven't identified it. Um, uh, much because it's just been in our homes. Like, for instance, I grew up uh, in the church called the AME Zion Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And from a very young age, I challenged my dad, why are we going to church only with African-American people, right? And, and he, he was forced to have these conversations and tell me about, hey, when uh, after slavery, they wouldn't ordain uh, uh, um, African-American pastors. 
And so, so there was a separation from those churches. And so many times, even when I'm preaching to our, 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 our players, I say, hey, there's, a, there's what we call a black church. And they're wondering, why is there a black church? And we talk about that there's some separations. But many times, I think people are so new to these conversations that they don't know what to do. Uh, but it's, it's been there. Yeah, it has. And that's one of the things that we have to become that trusted source for our mm. kids, right? We have to welcome those type of conversations so that they would come to us and talk about what, you know, they might be experiencing or dealing with or what they've seen uh, in the media, you know, because again, we want to have these hearts to hearts. And if we shut down conversations about race or we don't handle them uh, in this honest, open way to get them to think further uh, and also get a chance to speak into affirming them and building their confidence. Confidence. You can't even do that if you're not even willing to be that trusted source to to have these conversations, right? And to mm -hmm. to become that trusted source is to begin these conversations, even if they're uh, in school, you know and they point out stereotypes or things that they see on TV or things that they've heard, just don't be afraid to go ahead and delve into that conversation. Don't shut it down, don't deflect it, but just go ahead and sit down and talk about the things that you've even experienced and how you've overcome. I appreciate you both for weighing in on this, having a tough conversation with our kids about race. And certainly we do wanna see a better world. In order to do that, we've gotta learn how to uh, respect and appreciate our differences and realize that uh, black, white, brown, yellow, red, it all enriches our diversity and our culture. And we learn to appreciate each other and the accomplishments and contributions that we make to help us uh, grow better. So I appreciate you both, George and Tondra Gregory, strengthening the family. We'll be back with more of them in the future. Keep watching and make sure you check them out. Journey for Life every Saturday on Facebook as well. We're coming back with more after this. I want to thank all of the guests who appeared on tonight's program, and I want to thank you for watching. My final word is this. Let's continue to spread knowledge, faith, hope, love, freedom, and peace in the midst of everything that we're facing, because it's the only way we'll get through this. Good night. Tell you what I see I see God coming back To save humanity Take a look around I'll tell you what I see Christ stepping in To stop our insanity Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've taken a look around And I'll tell you what I see Our children safe because peace abounds I've taken a look around And I'll tell you what I see Mankind standing on